Last week I shared the scripture Isaiah 2, which is very familiar to us here. It says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I've been sharing, of course, these scriptures for many years because they're the text from which we get the name of our church, Mount Zion. Back in 1978, as we were starting the church, I prayed because I wanted to know really some of the direction for the church, but also the name as we were seeking the Lord for all these different kinds of things. And the Lord spoke these scriptures to me as kind of like a context of a vision, not just for our local church, but this is obviously the vision of God. How many know we're supposed to join God's vision? Amen. Not necessarily get our own vision, which is oftentimes what we feel compelled to do, but wow, join his vision. What could be better than that? Be a partner with God. His vision is listed here. Truly, God's intent, his eternal purpose has always been that in the latter days of time, the glory of the Lord would be revealed. All flesh would see it together. That's going to happen because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How many know if God has a purpose, it will come to pass? And the glory of that's going to come to pass through his people being a demonstration of his glory. Last week, I tied this to Hebrews chapter 12, which is a more spiritual picture of the same scene. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today because we're emphasizing the fact that when they come to the house of the Lord, they're going to say, to the house of the God of Jacob. And this is very significant for us to understand because there are things in Jacob's life that truly speak to us uh, about this present day visitation that we find ourselves in. God is the God of threes, and we know that in the patriarchs, it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that represents the third level. And I believe God is saying to the body of Christ, it's time to go to the third level. It is a new day. It is a new season. It is a new time. Say that amen to that with me. This is so important for us to understand. In Psalm 24, it talks about the Jacob generation. This is Jacob the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. How is the glory of the Lord going to be revealed? Well, I really believe it's going to be revealed through his people, but it's going to be his glory, not ours. Amen? And that's why it's very significant that we would lift up our heads, open up ourselves to him, and allow the king of glory to come in. Because when we allow the king of glory to come in, certainly it has an impact on us. And I believe this is a time when we'll experience the glory of the Lord. We'll experience his presence in a new and unique way and then be able to demonstrate it to our world. And this is what the generation of Jacob is all about. It's a people who seek the Lord. And this is significant, a people that seek his face. And this is, to me, speaking about an intimate encounter with God. The Bible says that Moses spoke to God face to face as a man does his friend. As a matter of fact, he was such a friend of God that one day his brother and his sister was complaining about him because they didn't like who he married. And God came right down and said, well, what are you doing talking about my friend Moses? How many would like God to intervene for you like that? (laughs) Right away, somebody's thinking, I know exactly who I want him to talk to. Amen. (laughs) But there's something about having that intimate relationship with God, which is demonstrated in the concept uh, of seeking his face. And so that's one of the most important things that we have to think about today when thinking about God, thinking about an intimacy of relation. And think about it in terms of, okay, we've known God one way in the past. And in Christian, Christianity, oftentimes people settle for one experience and they think about, well, sometimes we need two experiences. Uh, some people understand there's three, but how many know we're supposed to live by faith? Amen? We're supposed to be walking with God. And as we walk with God at all times seeking his face, there's going to be an ongoing experience of revelation of who he is. Now, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. And again, we 
understand God speaks in threefold things. On this third day, he's going to raise us up. Now, these references of Scripture talk about the fact that, first of all, God comes and, and reconciles us to him and heals us. On the second day, he revives us or he makes us alive. But on the third day, we're not just going to be alive. We're going to get up on our feet. I, I think that's exciting. Amen. A few years ago when we came back into this room because of the catastrophe that we had with our roof in the other room, the Lord started speaking to us immediately about Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel saw that great valley of dry bones, and he spoke resurrection life to them. It was a valley of dry bones that, by the word of the Lord, began to come together, get flesh, and ultimately got the breath of God in them. But the ultimate step was they stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. And church, this is a time when God is looking for us to stand up on our feet. Amen? The world has need of the church. The United States of America has need of the church. And so we have to be what he has called us to be. But this is a very important key to that again, that we may live in his sight. And so let us pursue what? Read that with me. The knowledge of the Lord. Now, his going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like rain, the latter and the former rain to the earth. Back in the late 1940s, they had what was called, coined as the latter rain revival. And uh, the moves of God in their seasons are reflective about the, the festivals that they had in the Old Testament. They had three festivals, the Passover, the Pentecost, and ultimately tabernacles. And these were celebrated around the harvest season. There were early rains. There were latter rains. And we, we've been in the time of the latter rain, but I believe we're in what the Bible calls the rains of the first months, when we're going to just see the former and the latter rain come together. It's going to be a great outpouring, but different than just Pentecostalism or charismatic experience where we receive the rain, we get all excited, and we come to life. But this speaks to us about revelation. This speaks to us about knowledge. The key factor for what we have to understand in this day is that what is it that we see about God? What is it that we know about God? Because when we understand this concept, it truly is going to have an impact on us. Now, notice it says, and we will live before his sight. Now, it's interesting because in the original translation of the scripture, the word isn't actually sight. It's the word face again, comparing to the other scriptures that I read to you. Now, this is very significant because... I believe it talks to us about, oftentimes when you read translations of the Bible, they're, they're built on the expectations of the people. And I truly believe that most people, when they think about God, we see ourselves as living in his sight, but we don't see ourselves as looking into his face. Come on, do you know what I'm talking about right now? Because there is a different in perception. Now, how many know it's a good thing to know that the Lord sees you? There's a Bible story about a woman by the name of Hagar. She had a child. She was uh, having problems with uh, Sarah, who was the other wife of Abraham, if you would. She was the concubine and handmaiden of Sarah. And she had to run for her life. And when she was out in the desert and she thought he was going to die, the Lord appears on the scene and says, Hallelujah, you are the God that sees. It's a good thing to know that the Lord sees your situation. Amen. But, of course, there's another side to seeing. I remember when I was seven years old, my grandma Campbell passed away. That's my mom's mom. And we used to always, she'd always, my mom would come to my room or I'd go to her room and she'd leave me my goodnight prayer. God bless grandma and grandpa was the first thing I'd say. And my mom said, you don't have to pray for grandma anymore. She's uh, in heaven now. She's in heaven. Oh, wow. What does that mean exactly? Well, she's up there and she, she assured me that, the people in heaven could still see us. So she said, you know, can't, you can't see grandma, but she can see you. I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. But I was a very shy and timid child. And when I'd take a bath or go to the bathroom, I'd always have this feeling that everybody in heaven was looking at me. And I'm like, I like the idea when God sees when I want him to see, but other times I'd like to, you know, just kind of close the door, whatever. Well, 
How, how you know, sometimes when we think about God looking at us, you know, that's a good case in point when we're going through a crisis, but oftentimes we have this feeling that God's always watching and we're not perfect and we're always making mistakes. And so there's this idea that, you know, God is always watching. And so most Christianity is based upon rules and regulations, whether I look bad or look good, whether I'm doing good, doing bad. But God says to his people in this day, and I want you to understand something, this is two-way communication. I'm looking at you, but I want you to be looking at me. That makes your face-to-face, -face, amen? So it's not so much that you feel like you're down here and God's watching you and you're like always uh, kind of on guard. Well, what is he seeing? What does he think? But it's like, come here. I want to look at you face-to-face, -face, says the mighty God. There's something about who I am that I want you to see today that you've never seen before, says the mighty God. And on this third day, we're going to pursue the knowledge of the Lord. How? By looking at him, not face in the sense of just him seeing us, but face to face in our walk with him. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Can you see here the correlation between I'm looking at him as if in a mirror, but as I'm looking at him and I continue to pursue the knowledge of him and as I walk with him, the more I see of him, the more I become whom I'm meant to be because when I know him as he is, then that's when I'm going to be known as the person he has intended me to be for the foundation of the world. And so I'm not saying, okay, God's up here looking at me. What can I do to be good? What can I do to make him satisfied? But no, I'm looking at him face to face. And as I begin to see who he is, it has a transforming effect on us. You see, we used to be just children, and you could tell it, because you could listen to our conversation, because you speak like a child. You, you, you talk about spiritual things, and you're like, what? You understood as a child, and of course, in that sense, you're going to think like a child. So an immature person is not going to have the ability to comprehend adult things. When you're growing up in the natural, how many you know when you first come to this world, you know, you're looking at everybody in your world as who can take care of me, who can comfort me, who can love me. And how many know some people never grow out of that stage? Come on. Or we can look at our lives, or we should as we get older, and say, wow, isn't it funny how I used to see the world when I was a little kid? That's a good case in point. Your mom tells you something to make you excited and doesn't realize how shy you are and how it's going to torment you. I remember reading a book about the spiritual life of children, and they were talking about little kids in Sunday school, and, you know, you take your kids there, and you're thinking they're just comprehending everything based upon information being given, but because they're little kids, and they were telling stories about this one person, yeah, I used to go to church, and we had stained glass windows, and there's one thing on the stained glass window that looked like a monster, so all the time I was in church, I'm like fearful of that monster, and you're like, I thought you were just learning a Bible story, or... Somebody comes into the room and they're talking to you and they're all excited about Jesus and you just think they're, ah, who are you? Can anybody look back at your childhood and say you had a distorted view of life? That's why you have to be so careful. You know, a lot of people think in terms of psychology and you want to fix the things from your past and a lot of the things about your past you made up. <laughs> Come on, think about it. Think about how you looked at the world when you were a kid and then say, wait a second, and I'm con controlled now by those experiences I had way back then? No, you have to understand something. If you really want to change, it's going to come through the dynamics. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes there's things about our past we need to reconcile. But the reality of change comes when we allow ourselves to be become mature and as we grow in the knowledge of him and the more we see of him then the reality begins to come and that's when it's not just him in a mirror dimly but it's him face to face and in that face to face encounter that's when you begin to come to the fullness of your identity because you don't know know who you are until you know who you are in jesus amen and uh 
Give the Lord a praise on that. And we talk about that here from time to time because I believe, again, that's one of the major issues of this season in God is knowing who we are in Christ and how to get there. Now, this brings us again to Jacob because Jacob had an experience with God. And in this experience, he's in this place where he's wrestling with someone. He doesn't know who it is at first. How many know he must have thought it was a dream at first? Because in the night, here's somebody wrestling with him. But all of a sudden, he realizes, wait a minute, this is a real thing, and, and, and this is God himself. And in the struggle that he has with God or the angel of the Lord, the Bible says the angel of the Lord said, let me go. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the Lord said to him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. But Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, tell me your name, I pray. He said, well, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. I don't know about you, but that, that's exciting to me, just that statement. For I've seen God face to face, and my life is what? Preserved. Now, I, I want to point that word preserved because it means to be delivered or saved or literally snatched out from something. Most Bible commentaries, when they read that verse, they'll say, Jacob said, oh, I saw God face to face and my life was preserved. And it's kind of like, oh, I lived through it. And so oftentimes there was this thought that people, well, if they looked at God, they couldn't survive it. But that isn't really what Jacob is saying here. Jacob is saying, when I saw God face to face, my life was delivered. I was truly saved I was snatched out of what I used to be because that's how the Lord took him from being just Jacob to Israel. How many want to be an Israel and not a Jacob? And that's why on Wednesdays we want to just really spend our time saying, Lord, I want to see you face to face. You know, I'm looking at my problems. I'm looking at my past. I'm looking at myself. Lord, I want to start seeing you because I know that just like it was with Jacob, when I grab a hold of you, and I see you face to face, that's when I'm going to be delivered. Because in the shadow of your presence or the light of your glory, no matter how you want to look at it, Father, it's in that place that things begin to happen inside of me. It's in places like this, Lord, that my life becomes delivered when I can experience your full salvation. How many know this is a time of deliverance? Amen. Amen. It's a season of deliverance, and we, the people of God, need to know there's a place of deliverance where you're not just praying for people, but you're leading them into the presence of the most holy God, and getting them there is the important thing, because once they get there and they begin to see him, you don't have any more work. God does all the work. Amen. Because it's in that place of seeing God face to face that truly our lives are delivered, and we're able to become the person of the fullness that God has called us with. Jacob, you've had your struggles. Now keep in mind, he had struggled with men, but when he was struggling with men, it was mostly based upon his own desires and his own plans of how could he get the blessing and the birthright from God. And so one day he had to run for his life and he had to leave the place of his nativity or his birth because Stealing your brother's birthright and inheritance, how many know that's going to put you in a bad light after a while? And Esau one day decides he's going to kill him, so he has to run for his life. And, you know, sometimes when you're running away from something, God's standing there waiting for you. Amen? How many know you have a God that knows where you're going? Amen? And when he knows where you're going, he can be right there, ready, and he's got another plan of action for you. In Jacob's case, it was he was going to send him to an uncle that acted just like him. How many know that's bad? <laughs> when you have to face somebody that's just like you, that's when you really begin to see the light of the glory. Amen? And it was in that place that he began to learn, Jacob, this isn't about you anymore. This is about you seeing what I can do. And so his struggle with men didn't get him too far until he began to struggle in the spirit, if you would. And ultimately, when he came to the place where he was 
in a situation he couldn't do anything for himself, it was there that he realized if something's going to happen, it's going to happen because of God. And that's why he struggled there in that place. And in that place, he experienced the fullness of all that God had for him. Now, this is a very important concept because I have this question, well, what do you need to see in the face of God? Of course, there are many things, but one of the things that we need to know when we're looking at God is this. Read this part with me. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Stop right there. What's left? The earth is the Lord's, and when it says all its fullness, that means everything that's in it. Oh, and by the way, even the people. Wow, God owns a lot of things, amen? That's why one day Abraham, when he had a tremendous military victory, was met by Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High. And he took him a tithe of all that he had because tithing is a recognition that came before the law that, well, everything belongs to God. And so he gave his tithe to Melchizedek in honor of the God who was the possessor of all things. And to me, that's the greatest principle of tithing that you can ever know is that you're recognizing God is the possessor of all things. Church, when you really know that to be true, it changes your outlook on everything, amen? Because all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, my struggle isn't with people. My struggle is not with my circumstance. My struggle is not with the economy because what happens when you realize it all belongs to him? Now, we know that there are the chosen ones that are God's elect. The Bible talks about that. But God says, you've got to understand that every person is in my hands. And so many times we struggle, we struggle, we struggle. But when, like Jacob, you look in the face of God and begin to realize, wait a second, this is the God who is the possessor of all things, all of a sudden you realize, hey, if I'm going to get anywhere, my struggle isn't with people, my struggle isn't with my circumstance, my struggle isn't really with myself. I'm going to struggle with him because he has everything in his hands. Amen? <laughs> How many know that makes you a prayer person like never before when you realize, wait a minute, I'm going to pray because it's God that's going to make the difference. It says, who is this king of glory? Well, it's the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Well, who is this king of glory? It is what? Read it with me. The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. You see, as the king of glory, he also is the Lord of hosts. And I believe this is one of the most important concepts we need to understand because when it says the Lord of hosts, it literally means the Lord or the God or the head of all the armies of heaven. So if the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, and all the people, every one of them, are in God's hands, and then when you look up to heaven, you realize he is the king of glory. What does that mean? Well, it means that he's the Lord of the armies of heaven. Well, if he's the Lord of the armies of heaven, and everything in earth is his, well, that makes a pretty big God up there, amen? You see, when you're the Lord of the army of heavens, you know something is possible in every impossible situation when you serve the God who is the Lord of the armies of heaven. That's why it's so important for us to realize, and to me this is a time that God is saying to us, we need to be people of prayer of never before. We need to be people, if we're struggling with anything, struggle with the Lord, not in the sense that we're fighting with God, but we're reaching out to him and saying, Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. You were wounded for my transgressions. You were bruised for my iniquities. Chastisement of your peace is upon me. By your stripes I'm healed. Lord, I want to be delivered. I want everything that you have for me. I want to be everything you've called me to be. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to see you as you really are. Lord, I'm tired of looking at the world through my eyes. I want to start looking through the world from your perspective. I want that heavenly perspective. That's why the prophet Hosea, speaking of Jacob, said, he took his brother by the heel in the womb. In his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. 
He found him in Bethel, which means the house of God, and there he spoke to us. Again, what is this? That is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven. The Lord is his memorial. And I believe it's so important that we would understand this. Now, leading up to the things about Jacob, in Genesis chapter 32, the Bible says that Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp, and he called the name of the place Mahayanam, which literally means a double camp. So you must understand that Jacob at this time of his life had a spiritual perspective. He was starting to see beyond just natural circumstances and situations. He was receiving a spiritual perspective already because when he went into this place where he would wrestle with the angel of the Lord, which literally translates into God himself, he also was beginning to understand the double camp of life, and that is, how many know there's the natural realm and the spiritual realm? And how many know in the spiritual realm, the Bible says there are angels? Anybody out there know that? Now, we don't have to try to deal with angels ourselves, but we do have to know that the Bible tells us in the scriptures that Hebrews chapter 1, that angels are ministering spirits sent by God to do something for us. That's why Jesus, even speaking to small children, spoke, spoke about their angel. You see, when you understand that, you begin to realize that God has these forces, angelic forces, if you would, that he uses and loses to liberate and do awesome things for his people. And, and whenever... Just like it was with Jacob, God begins to, move, uh, move, begins to move in a new way. There usually is sights and people begin to per, be perceptive of a heavenly realm. I remember that, and speaking of this latter rain revival that I was speaking to you about from uh, the church I was connected with in ministry training, that's the missionary temple, they had the beginnings of the worship and praise in their churches. And what happened in those days when God was just moving in tremendous ways in worship and praise, that people would hear angelic voices singing with them. And they would hear the heavenly choir. And it would happen from time to time. It was like the Lord said, okay, let's open up the heavens, give them a glimpse of something. I remember during the Jesus people movement and which I was a part of when I was a young man. And uh, there was just such an awesome move of God. And we would often hear stories about people picking up hitchhikers. Back then, people used to hitchhike. They certainly don't do that anymore too often. But it's very common in the 60s to go hitchhiking. And you didn't have a car, you just go hitchhiking. Matter of fact, I remember going hitchhiking with my brother Bill and going places, sometimes where we shouldn't have been going, but that's another story. And Remember Bonnie telling me, yeah, I used to hitchhike until somebody threw some Kentucky Fried Chicken in my face and I just quit. But anyway, <laughs> we would hear stories back in those days about people picking up a hitchhiker and the person would say, do you know Jesus is coming? And look back in the back seat and there would be nobody there. And of course, when people start talking about things like that, you can sure stories start being circulated that are imaginations too. But the truth is, is there was something happening where people began to be aware of the fact that Heavens were open, something was happening because God was sending forth his host from heaven. And I believe what we're going to be aware of in this time is a new sense of the armies of heaven are going to be loosed. And I want you to know something. You can watch on the news how wicked ISIS is and how powerful they are and terrorism, all these things. But I want you to know something. When the armies of the Lord of hosts begin to move, you won't see it in the natural, but you'll know it in the spiritual church. And I, I believe with everything within me, I, I, I was just feeling this so strongly in prayer last week, the Lord saying, I, I'm loosening the armies of heaven. I'm loosening those angelic forces. You're going to begin to see it with your natural eye. You're going to begin to see me turn things around, says the Lord, because this is the day when I will reveal myself as the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. God, this is going to be an awesome time in you. And, and, and so when you begin to know that, well, what do you want to do? You want to get up into the mountain of the Lord. Amen. At least that's my, my heart's desire. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? 
He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, we understand that this isn't going to come by our own efforts. We know it's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we're being called into the most holy place and we're being called to ascend to the mountain of the Lord. But when you know what the Bible says here in Psalms 24, the awesomeness of the Lord of hosts, the awesomeness of the God who's the possessor of the armies of heaven and all things concerning earth, you're going to say, Lord, just take me up into that mountain. I want to get a glimpse of you. I want to see you for all that you are. Can we all please bow our heads as we...